Hello, everybody, and you are very welcome to this virtual edition of Successful Perspectives. Successful Perspectives is when we deep dive or analyze a specific topic that is of value to our network, and we do this with an opinion leader or an expert. Today, what we are going to look at is the recent changes, the legal reforms here in the UAE, and what this means for all of us, what it means for your business. And I am delighted to say that I am joined by Mark Beer, OBE. Now, Mark Beer is a legend of, support, of sorts in Dubai, especially when we're talking about the business community. Many of us will know him in terms of how he has shaped DIFC courts, but of course, he is also co-founder of Seven Pillars Law. He is president of the Metis Institute. He is an expert network member of the World Economic Forum. The list goes on and on and on. And I'm delighted to be joined by Mark today. Mark is joining us from Blighty, from Great Britain. Mark, how are you doing today? And you're very welcome to Successful Perspectives. It's absolutely wonderful to be with you, Trevor. Thank you for that lead. And I think as my wife would say, I'm a legend in my own mind. And that's about as far <laughs> as it goes. Uh, but it's, it's, I mean, what, what an auspicious day as, as well. You know, we're seeing such transformation in the in the United Arab Emirates, such transformation, such development, something that we've all been hoping for, for for many, many years. I first went to Dubai in 1997 and some of these changes around investment regimes, around the court process, around um, livability, were all being discussed back then. We heard them again in 2009 with the crisis, this call, this clarion call for a different way of doing things. Um, and now we're seeing them in action. It's a, it's a very, very exciting time for the UAE. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And that was one of the questions I wanna to get to later on is when you first got to the UAE, would you have thought that these type of reforms would be on the horizon? But let's let's get to that later on. First of all, let's make sense of some of these reforms. Okay, in the lead up to this week, when we actually saw these reforms around the decriminalization of alcohol in terms of needing a license, et cetera, cohabitation for people who were obviously not married, um, divorce and separations of assets and how that is done, Samaritan law, you have laws around the suicide. Um, so some pretty big changes in terms of how the UAE operates, particularly Well, you know, if we think about many of them, they're not monumental in in the in in that sense. Um, they've been going on for years. When, when I came in '97, uh, there weren't really restrictions around buying alcohol. Um, no one really bothered if you cohabited, um, and I think that's been the case throughout uh, throughout Dubai, right? I mean, how many hotels actually check that guests have been married? So actually, Dubai has had, and I focus particularly on Dubai, but it applies just as much in Abu Dhabi, where we've been able to buy uh, alcohol at Jones the Grocer without a license for many years, or I shouldn't blame Jones the Grocer, near Jones the Grocer. Um, so the, these restrictions have been in place in word, in letter, but not in practice. But, yeah, but they, the implications. They been enforced, but I, I would jump yeah. in there, Mark, just for the sake of lively debate. I agree with you 100%. In many ways, there's been a, a willful ignorance to a lot of this, these particularly around alcohol license, et cetera. But every once in a while, this would create a headache, a PR, a PR nightmare sometimes for the UAE abroad. So that's why I think it's so important. Well, that's exactly the point I was going to make. So um, the, it, it, uh, the only time I've ever seen these regulations uh, supported was when the, the, the son of one of the senior partners of, of a law firm was moving to Dubai with his girlfriend. Uh, and the, the senior partner was asking me, is this restriction on cohabitation a real thing? Is it really something we should worry about? And I said, well, no, it's not. If you keep your nose clean, if you keep out of trouble, then it's, it's nothing to worry about at all. And then the mother came on and said, no, no, we want it to be a problem. 
We want mm -hmm. it to be a problem. So I said, why? And she said, because I want them to get married. <laughs> so um, <laughs> but generally speaking, I suppose the other um, issue was, for example, I was a coach at the rugby club and we had to do first aid training. And you trained for some nasty situations, particularly on a rugby field. And there was always that worry that if you went out and helped somebody, let's say, with a broken spine and you contributed towards their injury by trying to help them, could you find yourself in, in a court? And, and the answer was, yes, you could. But it was very unlikely. So what happened, Trevor, was that these these uh, issues were used as a stick to beat the UAE, but they were never actually um, implemented in a way which added benefits to the UAE. So I think it's it's absolutely right. It's just that the way that these laws were being used was simply by external agencies to say how the UAE was backward and the UAE wasn't considerate and the UAE didn't represent the community and the UAE um, didn't allow things that were universally accepted elsewhere. Um, so I think what, what we're seeing is not a liberalization, just an acknowledgement of reality. And as I say, what's critical in this is that we're seeing this at a federal level. This isn't an emirate level. This is a federal level. It applies just as much in Amal Kuwain as it does in Sharjah, as it does in Ajman, as it does in Fujairah, as it does in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. So the whole country gets what you might call a lift, a lift for tourism, a lift for livability. Um, and to my mind, the question now is, as we've seen, let's say, the wills, um, the, the, the probate situation, uh, develop. Um, what does that mean for the free zones that have been developing their own probate regimes going forward? Are we now seeing a situation where the outside the free zones is now at a level equal to or similar to the free zones? Do we need the free zones going forward or do the free zones need to make, make another big jump forward to sort of lead the way in, 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 in the way that, 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 that they operate? So it, in some ways it creates more question marks and I, I suppose that's the nature of the reform in the UAE as they've progressed over the last few decades, particularly with regards to, you know, particularly when you look at the free zones, creating so many free zones and each having its own um, set of rules and regulations to a certain extent has muddied the water. Do you feel that moving forward, there could be potentially, and we're only, we're, we're only, this is a supposition, but do you think potentially in the future there could be a restructuring of, of how free zones actually work and whether I'm sitting in another free zone and another in Abu Dhabi global markets for just hypothetically as an example that I could declare that I want to operate under the rules of a different free zone like DIFC and I only use that as an example. What, why should we be stuck to a physical location? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I want us to remember why the free zone concept came about. Uh, many people won't have been in, in Dubai at the time, but um, historically, free zones have been an antidote to the restrictions of federal law. So where federal law couldn't adapt fast enough, the free zones, in a sense, filled the void. So you have to see the free zones as an antidote to the um, federal regime as, as giving an opportunity to do things outside of that regime. It started with Jebel Ali. Uh, and the challenge that Dubai faced at the time was that the labor card, effectively your right to employ, your right to, to, to um, have workers, was something that was controlled at a, at a federal level. And at the time, often for no reason, you'd find that somebody had put a black mark, literally a black mark on your labor file and you couldn't employ anyone anymore. So what Dubai realized as it was growing and growing was to have federal restraints on the right to employ was becoming problematic. So Jebel Ali Free Zone in the early days, if, if anyone remembers, every employee was an employee of the government of Dubai. And in their visa, it said sponsor government of Dubai. And the reason it said that is because if you're a government employee, the federal labor law didn't apply to you, and therefore you didn't have to go to the Ministry of Labor, and therefore you got around that federal issue, right? So, so if you go back to the origin of the free zones, they're the antidote to inefficiencies in the federal system. So to your question now, now the federal system is at an absolutely fabulous level from an investment point of view, from a um, bankruptcy and insolvency point of view, from a livability point of view. And we've recently seen the changes to the civil and commercial court regime. So from a civil and commercial court regime, now we've got the federal level here 
what's the it, what do we need an antidote to it for and i think that's where the free zones are going to have to differentiate themselves and it may well be as you say that they just provide an alternative jurisdiction no better no worse just an alternative so the dfsa's regime the dubai financial services authority's regime may be better suited to a company than the central bank's regime even though they're both equally uh, fine so if that's true, you're absolutely right. The question then comes to geography. And if we think about monopolistic behaviors, monopolistic behaviors, which we generally accept are bad for business, bad for consumers, involve the segmentation of geographies, right? The worst monopolistic behavior is I say, Trevor, I won't come into your market and compete with you if you agree not to come into my market and compete with, with me, right? That's monopolistic behavior. That excludes customers in your market from getting access to my products and services and for me to compete and vice versa. And if you think about the regulatory model, that is the last bastion of monopoly because the regulatory model says, if I'm in DIFC, DFSA is the regulator. I'm the only regulator and no one else can touch my customers or get in or offer any form of competitive advantage. But I agree that if you're outside DIFC, then the central bank, you have exclusivity. I'm not going to touch your market either, right? There's that monopolistic behavior. And I think that has to change. It's changed with law firms. It's changed with courts. It has to change with regulators. And what that means is there's no reason why you can't have a beautiful office on the Corniche in Sharjah but be subject to the laws and regulations of ADGM. How in one country can you be in a position where you can geographically be forced into a zone in order to get the benefit of a particular regime? So I predict that if the UAE continues on this charge being at the forefront, we will move to a regime where you can, you can operate from wherever you want and you can choose the best regulatory and legal regime for you and your business and your customers. There's my prediction. <laughs> Now, Mark, this is why I love talking to you because you're you're bold enough to make predictions, and you know that there's. I a, predict that a, most of them are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem with predictions about the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, look, there's certainly a, a logical inference to what you're saying there. I guess the the headwind to something like that would be you've gone over the last, particularly say the last two decades and building out infrastructure around free zones. So where does it actually leave a free zone? You know, we're, we're doing this now from Media City. Where does that leave someone like TCOM? Uh, where does it leave the free zone model? You know, you have to get very hyper differentiated relative to everyone else in your offering. And if I understand what you're saying correctly, if the options, for example, purely an example, if the if the options onshore are it's a it's a it's a better infrastructure, a better legal infrastructure, and um, for companies, where does that actually leave the free zone models? And then that headwind. If I if I've spent a lot of time and there's vested interests in all countries, and I've built up all of this infrastructure, I'm not going to really want to let it go that easily, right? Well, if you love somebody, Trevor, you better set them free. And I think that's what there has to be an understanding that Dubai can't just compete against other institutions in Dubai and say, well, you're my customer in my zone. And if you want my management, then that's the that's the only opportunity. Uh, Dubai is competing in a global world, right? It's got to attract talent globally. So it has to become attractive. And if someone wants to be on that beautiful Sharjah Corniche or in Ajman or up in Amal Khwain or Ras Al Khaimah, because there's so many advantages of being in those Emirates, um, why on earth should we exclude them from getting the benefits of something that's been built in Abu Dhabi? And equally, if I'm an institution that wants to be in ADGM, why on earth can't I choose to be regulated by the central bank of the UAE? What are we saying? That the central bank somehow has a, a different, a bad, worse kind of um, regulation, so it shouldn't be allowed? That, that can't be right. So it does seem to me that you're right, this protective, what we'll call monopolistic behavior, which is I'm not going to allow you to uh, look for competition if you want to have my license and my, my services is something that may have worked in the, in the 1820s, but shouldn't be allowed to work in the, in the 2020s. 
Um, we have to focus on what the customer wants, not what the business wants. You know, the surest fire way to lose customers and to destroy a business is to, is to worry only about your bottom line. The best way to build a business is to ask your customers what they would want and then build a product around that. And I suspect that um, given the situation that the world faces itself now, and particularly the situation for hub-based economies like Singapore and Dubai, which are looking for ways to monetize and shift to a different way of doing business, a digital economy, a fourth industrial revolution, then an element of that is saying to customers, um, what do you want? And if they say, well, I'd love to be in Ras al Khaimah because it's the most wonderful of Emirates. It's got everything that I'm looking for, but I, I would love to be regulated by the DFSA and, be, and, and have the ability to use the laws of the DIFC, then why not? What's wrong with that? Yes, there might be a fee involved in it, but why not? Why not allow customers to do that? And then you may say, well, that would be strange. Well, it was strange until 2009, wasn't it? When the DIFC courts, which was the only court in the world that you weren't allowed to use if you were based in Emirates Towers. Um, imagine that, if you were in Emirates Towers in 2008, there was only one court in the world you weren't allowed to use, and that was the one over the road in DIFC. And the madness of that meant that in 2009, they changed the law to say anybody anywhere in the UAE can use the DIFC courts. Why don't we open that up and do it with um, the regulatory model and the legal regime too? Look, I want to come back to that very interesting point about, you know, global digital economy and hub economies like UAE, specifically Dubai. But just before we get to that, let's first just clearly we're going through at the moment in the UAE, there's an, a narrative of change. OK, even the reforms before the reforms that we're talking about now, you had the, you know, you had the golden visa situation. You have potential retirement being introduced into Dubai, a retirement visa, obviously, um, based on financial requirements, etc. But there's an option of that. There is this virtual visa for people who are working for multinationals in, in other countries, but want to work remotely from a wonderful place like Dubai or the UAE. So there's, there's this narrative cha of change that's been going on. And before we get to a global perspective, you tie in the changes that we're discussing now today. Where, where does this leave the rest of the region? relative to the UAE and specifically Dubai as a regional hub for, for multinationals as well. Because the reason why I ask that is for a lot of our members, probably 85% of them, a big part, so you're talking about a regional CEO of a multinational company overseeing Middle East, North Africa or Middle East and Africa. Some of them are a broader region than that again. And one of the, the conversations that they're constantly having with their global HQ, with the board, is where is the best regional HQ? Now, Dubai undoubtedly, um, from an infrastructure perspective, lifestyle, attracting talent, diverse talent pool, connections, Emirates, everything that we all know about, schooling, et cetera. It is, it is hard to, to pip Dubai in that sense. The issue was for quite a long time was, was cost and cost was increasing. Now, because of COVID, you're naturally going through this deflationary environment. Um, so that in a way, when we talk to our members, I don't think that's gonna be as big of a concern now moving forward in terms of the cost of using Dubai as a regional HQ. So that to a certain extent is, is solved, it's all relative, but then tie in the recent reforms where we are now and where does that leave UAE, Dubai, or more importantly, where does it leave the rest of the region relative to UAE, Dubai? Well, I, I'd make two comments. One is Dubai has done very well never to underestimate the potential to lose that sheen. Tehran was the Paris of the region and it was never ever going to change until it did. Bahrain took over and was the place to be. And then it shifted to Sharjah. Sharjah was the place to be. And then it shifted to Dubai. Let's not think that being the best place is fixed. Abu Dhabi is mm. giving them a very good run for the money, but you may say, well, it's still the UAE, right? But then the big question is Saudi. The big question is Saudi. It's the biggest market. It's great connectivity. 
the reforms are moving it into a different space. We're seeing mega projects like Neom and Red Sea doing really incredible, incredible things. So, as you say, we, we Dubai's the, the deflationary effect has made it more affordable. We mustn't rest on our laurels. The competition is out there and business will move to where business is best. Business is best when you get the highest profit on a risk adjusted basis where you can employ the greatest talent at the lowest cost, if you will, if you want to be crass about it. So I think that the, the, what are we seeing in the UAE is a precursor to what we're going to see in Saudi. I remember some years ago that it was the leadership of Saudi that proposed that it might be useful to get closer to Israel, but it was the UAE that signed the Abrahamic Accords. Um, I think these reforms that we're seeing in the UAE now may well be a precursor, a test bed, if you will, to see what the reaction is. And if the reaction is, is across the UAE, as I say, this is not just for Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there are other parts of the UAE which have um, uh, uh, less liberal views than those Emirates. Let's see how they react. And if they react well, and if, if the sun still comes up in the morning, um, then I wonder if we won't see them start to roll out in Saudi. Now, I have no knowledge of this and no reason to have any knowledge. It's just a, an, a guess on my part that in three or four years time, we'll see the reforms that we're seeing in the UAE today being implemented in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And then the question becomes, where would business rather be? Would it be in the kingdom or would it be in Dubai? Well, the answer from an eco economic point of view is in, in the kingdom. If the kingdom creates an environment like Dubai, that's really where the money is. However, um, the one thing that Dubai has always done is it stayed one step ahead. Same for the UAE, same for Abu Dhabi. So my sense is, just as I mentioned earlier, is this time for the free zones to take the next leap up the ladder? and to be more innovative, to be more creative, to allow institutions that aren't allowed onshore, uh, incredible e-banking facilities, the revolute of the region, for example, why isn't that operating now in a free zone? Why haven't we got a global virtual license issued out of a free zone, giving me accessibility to 50 markets rather than one market? So the free zones could now step up again because the, the, the federal side has stepped up. And in doing that, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and the UAE will continue to stay ahead of the competition, continue to offer something novel. And I believe that given the, the leadership that we're seeing in, in the UAE today, that's exactly what will happen. We'll bed down these changes. The, the free zones will step up out of their fintech sandboxes into a more traditional fourth industrial revolution leadership position, global leadership position. And, um, and then we'll, what we'll see is that they, they will position themselves to be way ahead of other places in the region. And as the other places in the region come up, UAE will step up again. And that's what will keep Dubai and the UAE number one. The UAE has an opportunity to step forward um, in a global position, to be a leader of a global digital economy powered by the fourth industrial revolution. What characteristics do you think the UAE has to its benefit relative to places like China that are already moving at a, a pretty rapid clip? Well, the, the first essential element of a transition into the fourth industrial revolution is a flexible workforce. And um, by that, what I mean is we're expecting that a, an indus a fourth industrial revolution economy will lose about 30% of the jobs. So if you transition fast into that economy, then you've got 30% of your workforce, which you need to redeploy. Now for many countries, they can't redeploy that workforce. So the transition moves slowly as they're trying to retrain people to be ready for the next step. That's what holds a lot of economies back. But the UAE does have a flexible workforce. It's built itself on the basis of a flexible workforce. So to that extent, it's well positioned. The second element to a successful transition is a knowledge-based economy. Um, as the world builds greater barriers, boundaries, and borders for trade, and as tariffs go up, the one thing that's universal becomes knowledge. And Dubai, particularly with the KHDA, but across the UAE, knowledge-based economy, training of people has always been a priority, real priority, especially for citizens. So they've got that 100%. Um, 
The challenge, though, is the digitization element of the fourth industrial revolution, and that is the ability to work seamlessly from anywhere to have licensing that allows you to operate anywhere. And the costs are, you know, if you look at the banking system in the UAE, it's still a high cost environment. Now, there's good reason why it's a high cost environment, but it's a high cost environment for business. And so what I think the only things that are missing to allow the UA to transition are, are um, in a sense, global license, because it's a global player. Why can't I get a license out of the UAE that gives me operability in the beginning across the GCC? Why can't I get a license in the UAE which gives me accessibility into Singapore? Why can't I get a license in the UAE that gives me the right to trade in the UK? This is something the government can work on. And in the same way, when people say, oh, it's not possible, it's never been done, that, that, that is not the answer. Because if you look at the number one passport in the world, the most accessible passport in the world, the passport that gets you into more countries than any other, do you know what it is, Trevor? I do, but I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> uh, no, it's, your, it's the UAE. The UAE has yeah. the best passport in the world when it comes to access to countries. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. They've worked hard on it because at a governmental level, they can build alliances around the world that would allow a license in the UAE to operate in many, many other countries. It would become a global hub for licensing. So number one, give me global functionality because I'm a global city of the fourth industrial revolution. Number two, allow me to transact at a very low cost. And what that means is an e-bank. Give me a banking environment which is entirely digital. I don't want to pay for branches. I don't want to pay expensive rent. I don't need expensive marketing campaigns. I don't need all of the bells and whistles that go with a traditional bank. No one needs a checkbook anymore. Um, give me an electronic banking environment that allows me to transact at a low cost globally. And the third element of that is give me a currency, a digital currency, which I can trust. So I can transact through my e-bank with a digital currency, which could be dirham backed. This is the model that China is pushing for. I think that the UAE is better placed for many reasons than China to deliver first on this. An international license, a digital bank and a digital currency backed by the dirham. Those, I think, are going to be the three stepping stones that the UAE needs, as we were talking about, to get to that next level again, where it becomes a global leader in commerce. And, and to your point earlier on, how the center of regional power, at least from being a, 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 a trading hub or a commercial center, has shifted around the region over the last several decades, it really is only the the paranoid that survive in a way, you know, it has to be that you have to keep progressing and you have to keep pushing and the reforms need to keep coming. So on this point, on this last question, what I'd like to ask you, Mark, is, as you mentioned, you arrived back in, in Dubai quite some time back and... And you yourself has, have actually personally helped to shape a lot of this development and change that took place, particularly in, in DIFC and DIFC courts. But given that these recent set of reforms to come back full loop to where we started off, these recent set of reforms, in essence, when you boil them down, broadly speaking, not every single one of them, but broadly speaking, they seem to be expat friendly let's put it that way right the uae recognizes that private consumption is imported through expats that live here so therefore with your crystal ball which is always an unfair way to ask a question <laughs> but with your crystal ball given that there there appears to be this recognition of the importance of being an expat destination and keeping expats here particularly when you're faced with a big epidemiological crisis um, what do you think some of the reforms could be in the future? You know, something we've often crops up over, over the years is the idea of some kind of permanent residency similar to Singapore. Do you think, given your, your long attachment to the UAE, do you think that could be something in the future on the horizon? And um, do you think it's possible? And, you know, if so, is it something, as I say, on the horizon or something that could be closer than we think? Well, I'll, I'll take you back many years to a, a talk that was given by a, an absolutely wonderful professor, Abdul Khalik Abdullah. 
and uh, he, it was in the heat of the pre-2009 crash and tensions were really building between the Emirati and the expatriate community. There was a real frustration at the behavior, the lewd behavior of the expats, the arrogance of the expats, this sort of, it, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. For those that were here in those times, you'll remember the guys that would fly in from Dagenham, buy a Ferrari and start selling plots of sand. And it was uh, no offense to anyone from Dagenham, but just seemed to be that 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 sort of part of the world attracted people to Dubai. And um, he gave a talk and I asked him, focus, would you, on the tensions? Because there's a real sense in the Emirati community that if there was a car accident between an Emirati and an expat, the police would trust the expat. And I said, the irony of it, Professor, is that if there was a car accident between an Emirati and an expatriate, the expatriate would think that the policeman would favor the Emirati. In reality, having spent 10 years working within the system, I can tell you that the policeman wouldn't favor either and would probably be as frustrated as everybody with the screaming and shouting that goes on at these things. So there was a, there was a perception issue, right, between the two communities. And he made a very valid point uh, as he spoke to an audience of expatriates. And he said this, he said, every morning as an Emirati, I wake up in the morning and I, I open up the curtains and I look out at what we've achieved as a country. I look at the position that we are in the global rankings. I look at the extraordinary progress that has been made since even he as a professor was a boy. And he said, I feel like I've scaled Mount Everest. And he said, I'm standing at the top and I'm looking around and I'm so proud of what's been achieved. He said, and I know that everyone in this room has helped me get there. You've all helped me to get to the top of my mountain. He said, but I can't help but feel every now and again that one, of you, one or two of you are trying to push me off the top and take my place. <laughs> and he said, just understand this. He said, I don't have a vote do not ask me to have a vote. And what he was saying was the expatriate community must understand that they are guests in someone else's country. And we must never lose sight of that. I agree with you that many of these reforms are tailored towards behaviors that the citizens, some of them, would find uncomfortable. It would be, as a Frenchman once uh, explained to me, um, you know, it's rather like uh, if he turned up with a leg of horse to an English Sunday lunch and said, could we cook this? Um, th th there's just something not quite right about it to the English sensibility. And it's absolutely right to the concept of people sitting and drinking alcohol to many Muslims. So, so let's not think that these changes are in a way going to do away with these core issues of respect and tolerance. That's going to be key. But in terms of the future, I think provided the balance between all of the community in the UAE can be maintained, provided that everybody does respect each other, provided everybody accepts that there are things that are allowed, but everything must be done with respect to the others. It's one of the broadest community bases in the world, the UAE, with so many nationalities. And everybody must understand that we live there and we live there with different perspectives. Provided that happens, I think we will see greater liberalization. But I think until there's a sense that, that there won't be civil unrest, that there won't be problems, that these reforms won't cause challenges among citizens and expatriates, then they might well hold back on the types of arrangements that we've seen in Singapore and elsewhere. But they will come, but they will come if the community, um, in a sense, comes together to demonstrate the unity that would or should allow people to have permanent or semi-permanent -perm um, residence. I'll just finish, if I may, with this lovely story, because there's people, I think, get het up on the permanent residence uh, piece of it. Um, in the very early days with Sheikh Rashid, who I think is really one of the unsung heroes of the world uh, in terms of what he managed to achieve, he started to allow foreigners to buy land in Dubai many years ago before Sheikh Zayed, um, uh, he, he didn't change the law. He just put a, a sort of note around saying, please don't sell land to foreigners. So Sheikh Rashid was selling land to foreigners and a lot of the land was being bought up by traders from the subcontinent. And the um, citizens at the time went to Sheikh Rashid and they said, Sheikh Rashid, you're selling 
our land, you're selling our heritage, you're selling our culture, you're, there won't be any left for us, there won't be any left for our children. Sheikh, you have to stop this. And the Sheikh turned to them and he said, you're absolutely right. If you see any of those foreigners at Dubai airport or at the creek with suitcases full of our sand, you come and tell me about it. But until then, if they're willing to give me cash for sand that's over there, I'm happy to take it. And I, th I, I think this, the moral of that story is that I think the UAE has always been welcoming. I think that it's survived very well and developed very well in what it's done. I think these reforms are the next step. I think we will start to see ever greater rights to residents. But I question whether there's a need to move towards citizenship. I don't think there is. I think that there'll be plenty of people who are still willing to come and invest, even if they can't take the sand away in a suitcase. Mark, as always, I've really enjoyed our conversation and thank you so much for sharing your insights with our, with our network. As always, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure, it was all mine. Thanks so much, Trevor. It's a hugely exciting time. I, I'm desperate to get over there. I'm really gonna try and come over in December. I'd love to see what's happening on the ground, but these reforms, these changes, it, it really demonstrates a transition, uh, a, a willingness to transition, which signifies what has created the UAE and led it to be where it is today. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not part of it anymore, but I'm so proud of all those that have made these things happen. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you very much, Mark. Until next time, thank you. And thank you for watching this very special episode of Successful Perspectives. Of course, if you would like to see the rest of all of our skill sharing videos with some of the top CEOs in Amir Boardroom, don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Emerging Markets Intelligence and Research, and of course, to subscribe on YouTube. Thank you very much.